So good morning. Excellent. Good morning. Uh, glad to see you here today. My name is Mike. I'm one of the leaders here at C3KW. We're pumped to be in the room with you today, especially because today was a weird day. We got snowstorms. We got new venues. All these wonderful things come together. So I'm pumped uh, to be here. And, and we're so thankful that Dune opened up its doors for us today to be able to do church because if not, we would not be able to do it. So, hey, I'm glad to be here in this first day of apparently it's first, day of Feb- first Sunday of February, but also there's the Super Bowl or something going, going on. I found out about that this week because, you know, basketball is a better sport, whatever. Um, but anyways, hopefully whoever you want to win wins. Anyway, and the food is good because how many know, whenever you celebrate Super Bowl, it's basically about the food and the commercials. That's basically it. Who cares about the game? Regardless. Anyways, hey, if you're here today for the first time um, at our church, welcome. The church, we're pumped that you're here, especially if this is your first time in church in a while, maybe your first time in church ever uh, we are excited that you're here. If you're seeking, searching, skeptical, cynical about God, don't even know what's going on, uh, we are especially in, excited to engage with you about the mercy and the love and the message and the ideas and the philosophy of Jesus and what we can learn from his life and his death and his resurrection. So we're going to do that today. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to jump into the book of Judges, book of Judges, uh, chapter 16. Uh, we're going to read a pretty uh, famous story. Most of us, whether you're Christian or not, have probably at least in some kind of cultural sense heard of this story, heard references to the story. Um, we'll be on the screen behind me in, in just a minute. Uh, it's the story of Samson and Delilah. Samson and Delilah. Now, I do want to set this up a little bit because it, it's going to add some context. So the book of Judges, if you don't know, it's a book found in the Old Testament, and it's one of arguably the saddest books in the whole Bible. Because essentially it is just this, this chronicling of Israel's moral de- deterioration. Just horrible after horror. It actually ends with uh, the line that the people did what was right in their own eyes as, a pair, as opposed to God's eyes. That this is complete kind of corruption of, of the people. And, and the thing about it is, is what would happen is, is Moses, he, he led the people to the edge of the land, right? Then, then he died. Joshua raised up after him, and he led them into the land that, that God had promised them after he freed them uh, out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt and all the stuff. And, and, but they didn't conquer all the land which God had said to do. And so Israel was living in this promised land with a bunch of these other nations with foreign gods and false religions. And part of the way that, that we believe God exists is he is the only God. And so one of the rules was that they can only worship him. And the problem was they would go into these foreign lands, these foreign um, families, and they start marrying them and worshiping their gods, which God had forbid. And then God would come, and he, because of the covenant, he would bring some justice to them, and be it through enemies or, or wars or whatnot. And then he would... And then the people would be like, okay, God, sorry about that. We're going to come back. We'll worship you now. They would repent. God would relent. He would save them. Then a generation would go by. They would forget. They'd start worshiping false gods again. And then there would be justice. And then they would repent. And then God would save them. And then they would forget. And just this cycle over and over and over again of them forgetting the, the God that saved them. And the way that God would deliver them was through these things called the judges. And these were kind of warrior types uh, like Gideon or Deborah who would be raised up for a season of time to essentially be the judge or the deliverer or the warrior or the fighter to free the people from the oppression of an enemy, the oppression of a foreign kingdom. And so there's been a couple of them, and then we get to this one uh, known as Samson. Now, Samson's story is interesting because it begins with his mom, who is barren. Her name is Manoah, and, and the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, hey, you're going to have a baby, um, kind of special, and he's going to be this thing called a Nazarite, which was a special kind of consecration unto God. Uh, not normal amongst the people. And what that meant was symbolically, Samson was not supposed to cut his hair, drink wine, or touch dead bodies. That was kind of these, these things that ritually kind of separated him out from the normal people. And he was given, as some of us know, this like supernatural strength. He was like Hulk in a skinny man's body. I imagine Samson was skinny. I don't know why, but I feel like He would have to be skinny because if he had all these muscles, he would just look like the strength was his own. So he probably was a skinny little kid um, that God just made super strong because he would kill lions with his bare hands. So this is a crazy story about about Samson. He was a strong man, right? And now here's the thing. What we learn about him is he would not be your typical spiritual leader. Um, He was not very good in the whole moral category uh, because the first story we, we, we we get of Samson is he sees a woman. 
um, who he thinks is beautiful, not because he finds you know, her, her character good, not because he thinks that she's a good, a good wife. He just says, I like the way you look. I want to marry you. And he goes off to marry her. Not to mention she was a Philistine, which was currently the oppressor of Israel. So he sees a woman who's part of the enemy of Israel, wants to marry her. So he just goes and says, I'm going to take this woman. And on the way down, on the way down, he takes a line, rips it apart with his bare hands, the Bible says, and then, and then he goes to impress this girl and makes a whole, a whole feast for her. Which I'm just going to say this, single guys. You want to impress a lady? Learn how to cook. I'm just saying. More than one dish, though. Like, at least three, so you can change it up so she doesn't know that you don't know how to cook, right? Just get those three down. He makes this whole thing, gets his parents to come back. On the way back, they find the carcass that, 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 of the lion. There was a honeycomb in it because bees like the dead body, I don't know, and he took honey and ate the honey out of the dead lion, which is gross, then gave some honey to his parents, but didn't tell them where he got it from, so they ate it, which made them ritually unclean before the Lord, but they had no idea. They go down to get this wedding happening, okay, and this is all just the first story of Samson, I'm just, the only the first story, right, and they get there, and, uh, and a bunch of the Philistines find out he wants to marry this woman, so they come to him and say, hey man, you got to owe us a bunch of stuff, we want some linens and a bunch of other crap, and then he's like, well, I don't want to pay you that, and then he says, hey, but I'll make you a deal. If you can guess the riddle that I'll say to you, then I'll pay you. But um, if you can't guess it, you'll pay me what you want out of me. So he's like, great deal. It's just a riddle. So he tells them some riddle about the lion he ate honey out of. And, of course, they can't get it. So they go to this fiancé say, hey, if you don't tell us the answer, we're going to burn you and your family alive. So, of course, he goes, I'll go figure this out. Trick Samson, gets the stuff. He finds out about this, goes on a killing rampage, kills all of them, um, and then leaves, goes back to his house in a huff and puff. And then in that moment, the dad of the fiancé says, well, I guess he's gone. I'm going to give her to the best man at the wedding. Talk about drama. Who needs a soap opera? We got the Bible, right? This is what's going on, right? And, and, and then Samson's like, okay, I think I want my girl back. So he goes back, finds out that the dad's given her away, goes on another killing. Actually, he wasn't killing yet. He burns all the crops down to the Philistines. Then they retaliate by burning the woman and her family alive. So then he retaliates by killing them all. That's all just the first story, Samson. Okay? And then after this, after this, uh, the Philistines say, well, I don't like the fact that you're killing our people. So they go to oppress Judah, which was the tribe of Israel. And Judah's like, I don't want to have this issue anymore. So Samson, we don't want you to be our boss anymore. We do not want you to be a deliverer. They try to tie him up and send him off to the Philistines. He's like, hey, just don't kill me. Just buy me. I'll go peaceably. So then he could kill more people. and ends up killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Right? That's kind of his whole fame, famous moment. And then he gets tired, prays to God for some water. God gives him a drink. And then he goes and finds a prostitute. Yeah, yeah. And then he moves a bunch of gates around and different stuff. And then that's where we get to the point uh, of, of the end of his life, where we have Delilah who comes in. And at this point, he meets this woman who, again, remember he was not supposed to drink? He meets her in a place that was known for its vineyards. I wonder why you're there, right? And he goes and finds this woman, and this becomes the last episode of his, his life, right? And so I know some of us, you know, can't handle a bad boss for like five days, Talk about 20 years of this guy. And, and here's what the hope is. I'm just saying, like, if God can use a messed up man like him, I think God can use you. I'm just going to put that one out there. That gives me hope. Because I hope I'm not as messed up as Samson. Sometimes maybe. But, hey, we're going to pick up. Chapter 16, verse 4. Okay? Chapter 16, verse 4. It says this. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak, and her, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, hey, seduce him. And see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we might bind him and humble him. And we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver each. So all of a sudden, Samson is no longer a love interest. He is a bank account. You know what I'm saying? She wants to get paid. So she immediately goes to Samson and says, hey, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound. Not even subtlety, right? Just, hey, tell me how you can be defeated, right? And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. And the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. And now she had men lying in ambush in her inner chamber. She is not patient. She wants to get this done. And she said to him, hey, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings. I love this line. As a thread of flax snaps when it touches fire. Just so, like, vivid. Anyone? Okay, apparently not. All right. 
So the secret of his strength was not known. Then he does this three more times about his hair and about some other things. I'm going to skip down to verse 15. And she said to him after three times of him lying to her, she says this, How can you say I love you? Ironic that she's the one saying that to him. When your heart is not with me, you've mocked me these three times, and you have told me where your great strength lies. And when she had pressed him hard with her words day after day, urged him, his soul was vexed to death. His girlfriend pesters him for a few days, and his soul was vexed to death. Anyways, and he told her all his heart, and he said to her, A razor is never cut upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. He remembers his, 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 his consecration. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, or so he thinks, and I'll be weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he's told me all his heart. And then the lords of the Philistines came up to her with, and brought money in their hands. And she made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man to shave off his seven locks on his head. And she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, well, I'll just go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he grounded the mill in the prison But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And then then the Philistines prayed him out in this big celebration of victory. And I want to skip down for the sake of time to verse 28. It says this, And then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I might be avenged on the Philistines for for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and leaned his weight against them and his right hand on one, one and left hand on the other one. And Samson said, let me die with these Philistines. And he bowed with his, all his strength. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all, who, on all the people who were in it so that the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. Let's pray. God, I would pray that you would use this story to teach us some stuff today. Thank you for your word. We do thank you that it teaches us, it instructs us, it challenges us, it changes us, encourages us, and comforts us. And I pray you'll do that very thing today. I pray, God, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here as it is in heaven. Father, we thank you for this very thing today. And, Lord, we do pray not for the Super Bowl but for the Raptors playing today in the afternoon. Amen. So, of course, right, this story is quite a unique story. And no one in this room is going to have, you know, quite the same calling that Samson has, being a deliverer of a whole nation, of course. But um, we can find some similarities in him because here's the thing, right? Samson is a man who, um, well, to be honest, depended a lot on external strength, right? Evidently lacking, having a deficiency of internal character. Because how many of us know, right, that at the end of the day, anything of the external, the external success, the external achievement, the external strength will not actually get me to the end of my life? Internal strength will. That's how we have to go. But we see this deficit in, 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 in this man, a man of so much external ability, but yet with, with so many um, deficiencies of actually a heart after God. Because through all the stuff that we've already described, not being able to keep his hands off women, in fact, actually you could argue abusing women for their beauty and for, and for, for, the, for their sexuality, a man who cannot stop drinking and getting drunk, a man who's just completely decimating the, the promises he's made to God over and over and over and over. And yet again, God uses him, which is just an amazing thought that God would choose a man like that. But what we see is underneath all those kind of I would, I would argue symptomatic issues, lust and, and adultery and, and, and just this, this anger, this murderous heart, right? Really, there, there's a sin that all of us have, right? Because I understand that all of us are murderous, right? Maybe some of us have felt that way. You get kids. Sometimes it happens. But, but, but here's the thing. All of us deal with the simple idea of, of, of pride and self-sufficiency. Pride and ultimately self-sufficiency. So here's the thing, right? Is, um, and the thing I want us to be aware of, and this, and this, if you, if you, or if you, if you're new to C3KW, then this might seem a little shocking. But if you're not, then you know how how I, I teach. But, but I want us to see, hear me today, the stupidity of, of sin, okay, and, and how we default to stupid so often. No offense, just truth, right? 
Because here's the thing. I don't think, I don't think Samson is, is dumb, right? Like, I don't think he's, like, like if some girl's like, hey, man, I want to sleep with you, but first, give me your visa card. Like, you know what's up. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know what's happening, right? So when she's like, hey, Samson, I love you. Tell me how, how you can be defeated. And then does the very same thing that he says to her. Like, you know Samson knows what's up. Like, he can't be that kind of dull, right? Like, and then, he, and, then, and then he does it like three more times, right? And exactly what he says, she, she, she ends up doing. And, and so I have to believe, like, this story always kind of confused me a little bit. Because, like, Samson, like, how can you actually be that dull, right? Some commentators believe he actually likes it. It's like a game to him. He's playing with her a, a, a little bit. But here's kind of what, what I think is going on, to, to be honest, right? Is we begin to see in Samson's understanding of his own strength that he doesn't think Delilah's words mean anything. He doesn't think that he's actually going to be defeated because he's never been defeated up to this point, right? And the problem is when there's a thing of sin, a thing of temptation in our life, we do default to stupid. We love justifying our sin, ju- rationalizing how we do it. And I know we live in a time where sin doesn't really exist as a category, but I want you to know as Christians we do believe, right, that the world is not just some subjective, arbitrary kind of like blot. And there's actually a, a moral framework, a kingdom of God that we live under and in that Forms our life, and although yes, sin sometimes feels good, and we want it, it's tempting, like a Delilah, right? It's never in the, in the end good for us, and we, and we do take that stand on evil and suffering and, and pain and wounds in our life, and so we don't want to go down that road. But how many of us know when there's sin that we actually want to do, we so easily justify our partaking in it, right? We so easily believe that that I won't get burned by this, that we all have our Delilah. Now, for some of you, I know it's not going to be an actual woman. Maybe for some of you, it actually is, right? Maybe for you, it's the addictions. Maybe for you, it's greed and gossip. Maybe for you, it's pornography. And maybe for you, it's alcohol. Maybe for you, it's whatever. Like, I don't know what, what, what it could be. But we, we run back to this thing we know is not good, but brings us a certain kind of joy, a certain kind of pleasure. I like this sin. And the problem is we begin to believe I'll be the one to escape its consequences. I, it will, I can manage this. Like I know God says my sin will find me out. And I know, you know, that, that the Bible says there's a way that leads to life and a way that leads to death. And I've, I've heard Jesus die for my sins and I believe that. But like this sin, I got. I can handle. I can manage my addiction. I can manage that issue. I, I, can, I can save my marriage from this. Don't worry. Like, I, I can handle this moment. I won't get burned. I can play with fire. I'll be the guy to escape. And I know we live in a time where even talking like this is hard because we, we, we are told all the time that essentially consequences don't really matter, right? That meaning and, and morality, it's subjective, it's arbitrary and whatnot. So just kind of go and do what you want. If it brings you pleasure and fulfillment, just, just pursue it and do whatever. But, but here's the thing, right? Like that is not how we understand life, Right? We reject that, that, that way of life. But the problem is a lot of us think that way. And, and a lot of us think about it like this. Even if you're not a Christian, even if you're a little more secular, right, you still potentially think of this framework where I've seen somebody do things that I think are wrong and yet succeed in them. Right? Like, like, like there's a psalm, Psalm 73, I believe, where it says that, that why, God, do we see the wicked prosper? I'm trying to be holy. I'm trying to be good. And yet I'm the one destitute, and they're the one prospering. God, I saw my boy Billy go hit up the club, and he's not having any problems. And I, I know my, my friend Jerry, he, he fudges his numbers on the taxes, and nothing bad ever happened to him. So why can't I? What is so bad about this thing? It's just a little bit of porn. Who is it really hurt? Right? It's just me. Right? Don't, don't, don't mind the, the rampant abuse in the industry and the supply and demand chain connected to sex, sex trafficking around the world because of your consumption, not to mention the, you know, objectification of women to nothing more than your object of pleasure, you know, male impotence because of pornography, oh, and the rewiring of your brain. But, like, it's just you, bro. But I can handle it, right? It's just a little bit of greed. Like, I know modern-day slavery's there and whatever, but, like, I got to get my shoes, and it's just gossip. It's not the worst sin. 
I know what Janice does, and it's not as bad as her, right? And we begin to play these games over that I can be the one to, to manage this where the Bible says to put to death that which is sinful. I, I think I can control it. I can have a little pet sin that, that's not fully gone, but I can just take care of it. And the problem is we believe we are greater than our weakness. We, we, we actually believe I'm stronger than my brokenness, and so I don't really need to, to get rid of it completely. And here we see Samson believing he is undefeatable. Because he's never been defeated before, playing and toying with this Delilah who clearly wants his, his end. And, and then the, the Bible makes this case that, that, that she goes to him. And, and basically, like, like again, I, I, I don't think he, he is, he might be spiritually dumb, but he, he is not actually dumb. He sees what's going on. But I actually believe because of what he says later on, if we read it, he says this after he's been bound. He says, I'm going to go out like the other times. Right? So he actually believes that he'll tell her this secret. She's been like, the Bible was put it very nicely, but basically she's like nagging him every day. Just tell me, just tell me. If, I th- if you love me, you tell me. If you love me. And the thing is, he loves her. She doesn't love him. This becomes this moment, and eventually this man of great strength, he can rip apart a lion, cannot withstand the pressure of, of, of this woman. Right? It says his soul was vexed. Like, I just, I think that's so funny. Right? This guy can kill a thousand guys with a jawbone of a donkey, but a couple days, and is vexed to death. Not just like, be, like vexed, vexed. That's such a good word, to death. What kind of strong man is this, right? But he tells her. And the funny thing is, here, here's what I think, right? And again, um, the story is just so, so interesting is I think he actually believes that, hey, I've touched dead bodies, I've drank wine, and the, and the strength has never left. So if I've destroyed the covenant in those ways, like I'm sure this last one, I'll still be strong enough. I still believe that it's actually in me. It's not a blessing of God. It's a right that I'm owed. But how many of us know, as Christians, we don't think God owes us anything. Like, like everything I have is a gift. I'm, I'm a gift-based person. Right? Every, every grace is a gift. Every breath is a gift. Every, every moment is this gift from God. God owes me nothing. But it seems as though Samson believes the strength is actually him. The strength is, is in his obedience. The strength is in his thing. So he says, hey, yeah, you could cut my hair and, and, I, and I'd be weak, sure. But then he actually doesn't believe that because of what he says after that, right? And so she does it. She ties him up. Presumably in, in the text you can read between the lines and, and people believe that it was probably after a night of a little bit of drinking, a little bit of, you know, time together, right? Because he's, he's, he's asleep enough to have his head shaved and not wake up right? He's kind of passed out drunk probably. And so he's there, and eventually he comes to. She's like, hey, Samson, they're here. And he gets up. He says, I'll take him like I did every other time. And then the most scary and saddest line almost in the whole Bible shows up. It says, he did not know the Lord had left him. He did not know. He had no spiritual awareness of the fact that God had departed. Like, like, we have to kind of kind of see this for what it is. And, and this is kind of a, a, a weird thing to say, especially to, to maybe if you're a little more secular, you don't really believe in God quite, quite yet. But, but there is a certain kind of intimacy of a life that we live with as spiritual people. That, that Samson, because of pride and sin, he, he was so numb to the fact that God no longer was close. Right? And, and, and although, hear me today, we are New Testament believers, which means the Spirit's already given, He's poured out. God's not far. My subjective experience of the int- intimacy of God can be made distant by my pride and my sin. And here we are. And he trades right, the intimacy of the Father for the adultery with Delilah, and he does not even know his strength is gone. And, and, and then what we begin to see is, is this, this ongoing numbness of Samson. Like, like have you ever, have you ever um, slept wrong on your arm? Ever had this happen to you before, right? Like, like you sleep wrong on your arm? This happened to me, like, it happened to me all the time, actually. But it just happened last week after All In. And I was sleeping, and about 3 in the morning, um, I wake up because of, of Charlie, and, and this whole arm is dead. Like, like, I literally had to throw it across my body to make it work. And, like, it wasn't just, like, for, like it was long. I was like, I'm paralyzed forever. I don't know what happened. Right? It was not coming back. It just was there flailing, flailing around. And the thing about it, right, is that how we often live spiritually, 
There's this part of us that we can see. We know it's supposed to work, but nothing is happening. And when we live in sin and death, this is what it is. I know there's this part of me that's supposed to be more, but, the, but, but because of what I love over here, this whole part's cut off. I'm sleeping on it wrong. Some of us walk around with a dead limb all the time because we'd rather have Delilah than delight in Jesus. And the problem, the problem with the, is ultimately this, is we can pretend to be Christian enough because my arm's still there. So you look at me like, ah, oh, he's got both arms. Yeah, but one can't work, right? But you don't know that. So I come to church. I lift my other hand because my one can't, can't work, right? And I'm there. And I, and, but, but, but when I'm actually at home, there's no devotion. There's no intimacy. I just look the part. Now, here's the problem. If you're a secular person, a little more spirit, uh, not quite, you know, onto the whole Jesus thing quite yet. Here's the thing I, I want to say to you that it's hard to make the objective case for, but it, because it's so, so, so much of the subjectivity of, of spirituality. But here's the thing: it is outside of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, when He actually came to take all that is spiritually numb in you and bring it to life. That there's actually parts of your humanity that you don't even know about yet. Parts of who you are, your calling, your gift, your purpose, that right now because of sin is dead and numb. He actually wants to bring freedom and life to bring you into this, Jesus said, the fullness of life. And can I tell you that it's, it's one of those things where the Bible says you have, you have to taste and see the Lord is good. So I, I can't necessarily convince you of that outside the fact that you would come and receive from the Lord an actual awakening. In fact, some of you pretend to be Christians in the room today because you've never been awakened. You've played the religious game. I'm good, I go to church, I do that. But you actually don't even know the difference between those who are full of the life of Christ and where you're currently at. And I, and I want to just give us some hope today that calls in this place of full awakening, full life, that we have parts of our humanity that Jesus actually wants to awaken in us tonight. We don't have to live spiritually numb, right? And, and so we see this happening in, 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 this, in this man. And, and so see, he comes and, the, and they rush in. And, and, and then he gets bound because he doesn't know he's not strong anymore, right? He, he gets blinded so he can't see where he's going. And they bring him into captivity to do the work of a donkey. Okay? And so I want, you, I want you to see this story arc, right? This warrior, this, this, this deliverer, this judge of Israel is now bound, blinded, and becoming a slave of the enemy he was supposed to defeat. Living as the laughing stock of those people. And, and, and I want to say this very clearly because I love you guys, that, that in, 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 the ra- in the realm of Jesus, in the realm of how God operates in, in the world, there's only two ways to live life. Humility or be humbled. That's it. Plan A, humility. Walk with God. Be dependent. Don't be self-sufficient. Or be humbled by God. And he will humble you because he loves you to shake you out of pride. He will allow life to go in certain ways so you learn dependency, right? That he wants us to walk ultimately in the humility of our faith, not in in, in the hubris of my own might. And and we end up in these places. And here's the problem, right? Like, I don't know about you, but if you ever felt like this, but but just see the almost emotional state of, of, of the Samson man. He was supposed to be the great warrior deliverer. Now he is nothing more to these people than an imprisoned animal. And here's the thing. I would argue that some of us actually can relate a lot to him. Because I I, I don't know about you, but sometimes we feel as though my past sin puts me in this prison of of perpetual shame. Right? Because he's on on the mill. He's going around circles the whole time. And because of what I did, because of what's been done to me, because, because of the failing of my heart, because of whatever was in my life. I, I can't let people see that. I can't let God see that because if they knew what was going on, the shame, the rejection. So I pretend, I put on the face. I don't let anyone in. In fact, in fact I don't even go before God because if God really knew me, although he already does, I have this weird complex that believes that he would reject me for whatever reason. And so we live in this place of shame because of my sin, because of my past, because of what's been done to me, what I've done to others. And I'm caught in this ongoing, this mill round circle of shame forever. And I want to say this to you today. If that is you, maybe it's you right now, maybe, maybe it's been your story over your life, verse 22 needs to become your favorite verse ever. Ever. Right? 
one of those verses, those light verses that, that they, they get put on your, on your mirror. You know, you write them on a sticky note, put them on your mirror, something like that. Or put them on your home screen, on your phone, or, you know, tattoo it on your body, right? Get a little more original than, like, for such a time as this, or everything beautiful in its time, right? Christian white girl stuff always, right? Put this one on your body. Ready? I'm just kidding. Don't do it. But, verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow again. No applause for that? That's nuts. No, you know, here, because here's the thing, okay? Because here's the thing. I, I, I want you to see this because I get it, right? Samson, right, he is, he, he, is, he is this prideful, arrogant man that has been humbled under the weight of his defeat, right? And now, see this, he is literally the image of Israel, right? The image of Israel, why? He's bound, he's blind, he can't see where he's going, he's captive by the enemy, and God has departed, he becomes an actual image of the people of God. And yet in that space, the hair begins to grow again. Why? Because the hair is not about the hair, obviously. Why would he say that? We all know hair grows back, right? Normally, for those not follically challenged, hair grows back because it's about the strength. That this was a symbol again of God saying you can still be strong again. And in the moment of the prison, the grace begins to grow. And it says that, that they bring him out. I want you to see, just Im imagine this because it's really important. right? They, they bring out this warrior who's been humbled to stand before a party of about 3,000 of the lords of the Philistines. The people who are in charge of, 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 this, of this enemy. And think of kings, commanders in chief. Warriors, things like this. And they're, and they're parading him up as a worship symbol to their false god, Dagon, who they believe brought the victory when they really should say it was Samson's stupidity that actually brought this upon himself, right? And so they champion him up and they put him up between two pillars and tie him up so that he just could stand there probably naked in all of his shame. And they can look at him, him humiliated, them reveling in his defeat. And in that place before the enemy... He says a very simple prayer, a beautiful prayer. In fact, one that I think most of us should learn how to pray a little bit more. He actually, in his life that we have recorded, prays two times, one for water and one for this, where he says, oh, Lord God, remember me. Remember me. There's no pomp. Right? There, 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 there's no pride here. It's God, here I am, blind, bound, stubble. Remember me one more time, essentially so that I can fulfill my purpose now. That I could defeat the enemy, bring restoration to Israel. May you allow this to happen. And the Bible says that God moves in, that he gets strong again, and from this place pulls down the whole temple. And in one act of self-sacrificing strength, delivers Israel by, by, by defeating more enemies in one moment than his entire 20-year career up to that point. Up to that point. Because how many of, of, of you know that after a season of being humbled, there actually can be greater power in your life? And here's what I want you to see today, friends. Right? Anybody, anybody, the hair can grow back. The hair can grow back. Here's the thing, like, I, I, I know you could tell me today, well, Mike, you don't know what I've done. I get it. God can use me. He loves me, whatever. But, but you don't know my story, Mike. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what's been, been, been done to me. Maybe before the addiction, God could have done something. Maybe before the, the porn, God could have done something. Maybe before the divorce, the adultery, maybe before yesterday, maybe before last week. But right now in this space, you don't know Mike. Mike. Here's the thing. I don't need to know your story because I know Jesus is. And this is the good thing about the grace of God. If there's breath in my lungs, like Samson discovered, there is still hope for redemption. If there's still life in my body, hear me today, there is hope for grace. This is the good news of our God, that in Jesus, hear me today, right? There is never too weak. There is never too broken. There is never too sinful. There is never too dark, too dirty, too, too wounded, too, 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 too messed up, too jacked up. There is never too anything except too strong, too prideful, and too self-sufficient. In Christ, what do we learn? 
In Christ we learn that it's actually in our weakness his strength is made perfect. That it's in my humility that I'm given life. It's in my repentance that, that, that the fullness of my soul is found. This is the, the nature of the grace of God, that it's not actually about me. That's the good news. This wasn't really ultimately about Samson. This was about the people being delivered. That when he called out to God after a moment of humbling, God could use him to do the purpose to deliver the people. This becomes our story that, that in Christ, every moment that there is breath, hear me, there is always grace. Mercy's new every morning. This is literally the story of our life that I depend on God for almost every single breath. And when I stop depending on him, life gets harder. This is who we are, friends. We are a post-prison Samson, broken and humbled, yet full of strength for the purpose. Now hear me today, don't be so prideful and self-disqualifying that you think God can't use a sinner like you. Because guess what? That's all he uses. Anybody not a sinner? Right? Like, like this is the reality of our faith, that, that I, can't, I should never disqualify myself from a grace I could not earn in the first place. I don't deserve in the first place. So therefore, why would I think God can't reach into my life? If there is breath in my lungs, then the empty tomb can still reach into my heart. And I want you to see this today because really the story, I should have said at, at the beginning, is not actually about you at all. The whole story of Samson has nothing really to do with you. Hopefully we learn a, a few things, but ultimately the story is is about Jesus and how he is the better Samson. Why? Because follow this. There was another one sent from God full of supernatural strength to be delivered from God's people so they could get out of captivity to the enemy. His name was Jesus. And instead of walking around slaying bodies, he healed them. And when he was put in humility, bound before the enemy, and, and made to be beaten, bruised, mocked, and laughed at, he too was put up between a couple pillars so that the enemy could mock, thinking they had won. But in one act of self-sacrificing love, he destroyed every power against us, that this is our God. Not that it ended in death, but actually resurrection. The story of Jesus is the greater Samson, because when he prayed, for, remember me, Jesus prays, forgive them. Did you hear the nature of the story where the enemy thought victory and humiliation was his? That becomes our very triumph in Jesus. He is the greater Samson. He is the greater salvation. There is no greater story than this. And so friends, here today, here what, here's what we have to understand. Here's what we need to go to in our hearts forever. That when we were maybe happy in our captivity... Maybe when we enjoyed the sins that we, that we pursued. There was one sent to deliver us from the enemy of our sins, shame, and death. His name was Jesus. This is the grace of God, that we rely not on ourself, not on our strength. We, 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 we look to Samson and see a man prideful, self-sufficient, broken, yet humbled, and full of grace after that point. My heart for us is simply this, that the gospel of Jesus should be the thing that frames our life and frames every breath. That, that unlike every other religion, which, by the way, says it's all about you, right? the idea that, 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 that if I'm a traditional religious person, then I have to earn this. It's about my works. If, if I'm more of a secular person, it's about my fulfillment. My actualization, if I'm more of an Eastern religious kind of person, it's more about my enlightenment and my, and my escaping. Jesus is the only one that says, guys, don't trust a system of belief. Trust the person. That this is not about your work. It's about his work. The gospel for us today is not a bunch of stories about how you need to go be a better Samson now. It's not about you. You don't be the better Samson. This is about what Jesus has already done for us. The story of Samson to remind me and my weakness that it's in that place, I become strong. There is this passage in Hebrews 11 where it's called the Hall of Faith. And it lists off these heroes of faith throughout uh, history. And, and, and it mentions Samson. It's kind of nuts, is it? That he made that list. But it says that there were some who were weak, in, who, who, the weak found strength. I think that means him. 
that his, his example of faith was actually not in the 20 years prior, but his last few months. That we could see a man, though weakened, strong in the grace of God. Here is my plea to the church today. It's a simple one. Don't disqualify yourself from a grace that you can never earn in the first place. Don't take yourself out of a game, right, that, that, that God called you into. Hear me today. God has chosen to give grace to every single one of us. And he didn't die on a cross so you could sit in shame, hide away, unused in the kingdom when he bought your life with his own. Here's my question. Which Samson are you? Which Samson are you going to be today? Are you, are you the kind of pre-prison Samson? Prideful and self-sufficient. Strong because I got this. I don't know how to do it. I can manage my life, Mike. Don't tell me what to do. Or you post-prison Samson. Humbled. God, I'm not perfect. Remember me. Here's my condition. Here's where I'm at. Would you give me strength again today? Who are you? Who are you? Ben, you guys can come up. I, I want to end here together. The question becomes, how, how, do you, how do you know? It's a very simple thought. If you're here today and you know that you kind of honestly judge a lot of people, kind of live as a hypocrite, good, good on the outside, broken on the inside, maybe today you're here and you don't really believe that, that you got issues, that everyone else is the problem. It's not you. It's not me. It's my husband. It's not me. It's, it's the girl at work. It's like, I'm not the issue going on here. That's what we constantly believe. We're constantly passing blame. If we're stuck in sin, perpetually unable to defeat it in my life, or maybe, or, or maybe you're more self-pitying, self-defeating, kind of self-disqualifying. The irony is whether you're arrogant or self-pitying, you're the same heart. One of pride, believing it's all about you. All about you. And today the grace of God says this, it's not about you at all, friend. His love is not dependent on you. His mercy is not, it, 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 it does not hinge on the goodness of your heart. It actually meets us in our brokenness and brings us to life fully again in him. This is our confession. And my heart for you Christians is simple. It's simple. That instead of walking around with dead, numb arms that we call faith, could we be fully alive again today? Could we step out of sin and pride and brokenness and addiction and walk into the fullness of life, submitted to Jesus, not self-dependent, but fully dependent on him, not self-sufficient, but believing that there's a grace that I can never earn, not trying to be strong in me, but actually knowing there's strength beyond me. And if you're here today and, and, and you're not a Christian, maybe you don't consider yourself a person of faith right now, here's what I want to say to you very clearly and honestly is I want to invite you to actually become a Christian today, right, right now, because here's what I do believe, right, that every part of my soul that is numb to real life can come alive. That we don't have to live perpetually believing there's more, that there's something that's a part of me that I think should be there but it's not quite working yet. Every aspect of my humanity, Jesus came to redeem, restore, and bring back to life if we would trust him. And the only thing that keeps me out of the kingdom of God is not righteousness, is not holiness, it is your pride. The only thing. Christians, the only thing that keeps you feeling subjectively distant from God is your pride. The only thing that keeps you locked ultimately in sin for far too long is a, a pride. And today, pride can die, grace can rise up, and the hair can begin to grow. Amen? Would you stay with me today? I'm going to pray for us as a church.